A few months before, Ebby had been fined several times for being drunk in public that summer of 1934, and if he were fined again, they threatened to lock him up in Windsor Prison. Ebby had joined an Oxford group after two of his former drinking buddies came to visit and offered him a free membership, and the Oxford group had gotten them all to change. One of these former drinkers named Roland had been to Switzerland to see Carl Jung, and Jung told Roland that it didn't matter whether or not he believed in God, but that he better find out how to have a serious spiritual experience if he wanted to be cured of alcoholism. And Roland took Jung's treatment for a year, along with all the other rich people, rich people doing the health nut regimens that were all the rage at the time with the Nazis. And Ebby would start drinking again shortly after he went to see Bill W. Ebby had decided to paint his house, but first he needed to get drunk to do it. And there were some pigeons sitting there on the roof, so Ebby would gotten a double-barreled shotgun and started shooting them, and the neighbors called the police. Instead of going to jail, Roland from the Oxford group came to court and asked the judge to release Ebby into his care, and Ebby stayed with one Oxforder after another until he ended up with one of them who was running the Calvary Episcopal Mission on 23rd Street in New York City. And someone there told him about poor drunken Bill W. And Ebby went to see Bill. The Oxford group men living at the Calvary Mission called themselves the Brotherhood. And a few days after Ebby went to see Bill W., Ebby came back with another brother and they laid out the Oxford group principles for Bill at his kitchen table. Soon after, Bill W. was inspired to go see Ebby and the other brothers at the Calvary Mission, even though Bill was very drunk, and Bill gave a totally intoxicated speech at their meeting where he stuck out because he was wearing a better suit. On the way to Calvary Mission, Bill W. had stopped at a bar and talked to a Finn named Alec, who was a sailmaker and a fisherman. And when Bill heard the word fisherman, he thought of the mission where there were fishers of men. And when he got to 246 East 23rd Street, he joined in the altar call and gave his life to Jesus. Three days later, Bill W. checked himself in town's hospital on the 11th of December, and it was two weeks after his 39th birthday, and he had drunk three bottles of beer and was carrying a fourth. And again, he got the barbiturate and the belladonna treatment, and Bill W. thought about what Ebby and the Oxford groupers had said, and a few days later, Ebby came to visit Bill, who was terribly depressed that he wasn't as thrilled about God as Ebby. And Bill felt so bad that he asked God to show himself, and immediately Bill was electrified. Suddenly my room blazed with an indescribably white light. I was seized with an ecstasy beyond description. Every joy I had known was pale by comparison. The light, the ecstasy, I was conscious of nothing else for a time. Then, seen in the mind's eye, there was a mountain. I stood upon its summit where a great wind blew, a wind not of air but of spirit. In great clean strength it blew right through me. Then came the blazing thought, You are a free man. I know not at all how long I remained in this state, but finally the light and the ecstasy subsided. I again saw the wall of my room. As I became more quiet, a great peace stole over me, and this was accompanied by a sensation difficult to describe. I became acutely conscious of a presence with a capital P which seemed like a veritable sea of living spirit. I lay on the shores of a new world. This, I thought, must be the great reality, the God of the preachers. Pass it on. Page 121. Bill W. was let out of Town's Hospital on the 18th of December in 1934, and he never had to drink again. And Bill and Lois started going to the Oxford group meetings from that day onward. The Oxford groups were ten years old when Bill and Lois began attending. And the meetings were at the Calvary House at the Episcopal Church where Sam Shoemaker was the rector, and at the time they were still called a first century Christian fellowship. The Oxford groups had been started by a 
Pennsylvania Dutch German named Frank Buchmann, who was a Lutheran minister, and Dr. Buchmann's father had been a butcher who owned a tavern and described his son as having a wanderlust, and the name Buchmann was pronounced Bookman. Buchmann went to China with the YMCA in 1916 via India, where he met Mahatma Gandhi, and when Bookman came back to America, he started meeting with small groups of people to try to figure out how to help the Chinese with their opium problem. Bookman went back to China in 1918, and Sam Shoemaker was there with the YMCA and met Bookman in China, and Charles Barnes Towns had also been sent by the American government to offer the Chinese his new cure for opium addiction. Ten years earlier, Buchmann had talked the Lutheran Church into letting him run an orphanage in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and in 1908 he'd gotten into a fight with the trustees over the food budget for his boys. Buchmann went on vacation to England all bent out of shape where he heard a Salvation Army lady speaking in Keswick, England, and she said that resentment cuts us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. And hearing that changed Bookman's life. With his new revelation, Bookman came back to America and worked as a secretary for the YMCA at Penn State for five years. And he was sent by the YMCA to China for those six months in 1916, returning to America when his father became ill. Back in America, Bookman started taking his small groups of people along with him, traveling and preaching, and Bookman took his groups to college campuses where the students would sit around and practice telling the truth. Bookman was good at getting people to donate money towards his evangelical work, and his groups had no central office and no official membership lists, but people would gather together and call themselves a group and then take turns having meetings in each other's homes. Rich people enjoyed the meetings because they were in the habit of having dinner parties already and they needed new conversation at the table. And the groups would sit in a circle and take turns talking so they could share their personal spiritual experiences. Radio and radar had just become well known and Buchmann said that people were like radio antennas and that God was, quote, a perpetual broadcasting station and all you need to do is tune in, close quote. The Oxfordders took science very seriously and asked how you would feel if your thoughts were flashed up on a screen and they would listen together for God's voice during the meetings and sometimes it would get a little weird, but that just kept it interesting. The groups didn't even have a name at first and were just called Buchmanites. And the meetings caught on because they were very simple. And the house parties were popular because dinner parties were all the rage, and so were seances. And what was different about Buchmann's meetings was that people sat around listening to God instead of talking about him. The meetings were informal, and they called each other by their first names, and they stressed anonymity so the rich people would feel more comfortable sharing. And the sharing was considered as personal house cleaning, and they also believed in making amends. Bookman told new people to experiment with God rather than just take someone's word for matters of religion or faith, and the groups were told to seek what Bookman called the essence of the Sermon on the Mount, which was absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. Every day they would have morning meditation for a half an hour when they would listen to God and they would try to communicate by hearing him through, quote, two-way prayer, close quote. The Buchmanites wanted to, quote, think God's thoughts after him, close quote, and they read the Bible often and they counted on direct inspiration from God for personal guidance. And whenever someone got with the program, they called it getting changed. What little doctrine they had was based on individual responsibility with no formal organization, although oh, along with divine guidance that was shared with the group or others. And the groups had plenty of slogans such as Crows are black the world over and fake it until you make it 
and your best thinking got you here, and P-R-A-Y, powerful radiograms always yours. Another slogan said, a spiritual radiogram in every home, because the radio was the new miracle, and to the Oxfordders, praying was the same as transmitting radio waves. When one of the groups went to South Africa in 1928, they were called, quote, those people from Oxford, because they'd just been to England at a previous stop, and a porter had put tags on their luggage saying Oxford. The South Africans knew about Oxford University, and to them the Buchmanites were fancy people because South Africa was a long way away from civilization, and the name Oxford stuck even though the Oxford groups had nothing to do with Oxford, and Buchman had not liked the term Buchmanism and thought the name Oxford groups gave his movement more dignity. Buchman lived in a very nice house on West 53rd Street, and the house was owned by John D. Rockefeller, and the woman holding the lease was, lease was in the Oxford groups, and Buchman had a tea for the Queen of Romania in that lovely house. And 200 people were invited, but the Queen was suffering from a cold and left early, although she had asked Buchman to, quote, read her sins in her face, close quote. So he said, pride and self-satisfaction, and it had just been a wild guess. Baronesses and countesses from all, of the, all over northern Europe would come to visit Buchmann, and his Oxfordsters would meet for house parties in the homes of rich people, where plenty of famous people showed up, and sometimes the famous people only came once, but they would come, and Edward VIII even went with Wallace a few times. Buchmann's house parties became very trendy with social climbers, and Mr. and Mrs. Henry Ford became Oxford groupers, and Mrs. Vanderbilt threw a house party for Buchmann, and Mrs. Edison gave a dinner party for him, and she invited over 100 people and compared Buchmann to her husband's light bulb. Even though the Oxfordsters concentrated on recruiting the rich and famous, the common desire in Buchmann's meetings was to know the will of God, and they would gather together and ask God to reveal himself and then listen for inspiration from the Spirit. What was different about the Oxford groups was that people were sitting and listening to God for the first time, and God seemed to like it and with no dues or membership roles, and no paid leaders or former formal rules for the meetings. It was easy to join and easy to belong, and it was also a lot of fun. Bill W. began having separate Oxford group meetings at Clinton Street for alcoholics only, and the Oxfordsters called his meetings those, quote, held surreptitiously behind Mrs. Jones' barn. Pass it on, page 169. Before the end of 1935, when Germany had just passed the Nuremberg Laws, the Oxford group leaders told their members not to go to Bill and Lois's house anymore because the focus on alcoholism was said to be contrary to the goals of the Oxford group movement, especially because in pushing towards recruitment of rich and famous people who could finance and drive forward publicity, the issue of not drinking would certainly offend too many potential members. By the grace of God, Bill W. was sent to Akron, Ohio to try to win a shareholder vote of the board of the National Rubber Machinery Company, and Oxfordsters had previously been invited to Akron by the Goodyear Tire Company because they'd gotten the president's son sober on a train ride from Denver in 1931, even though he'd started drinking again a few years later, and after staying ten days with Goodyear. The Oxfordsters had gone on to St. Louis to work on Mr. Bush's drunken son. Akron was a one-industry town manufacturing tires for cars and trucks, and the owner of Goodyear was a German named Frank Sieberling, who'd named his company after the Charles Goodyear who had discovered how to vulcanize rubber in 1839. By 1913, Sieberling's machines in Akron were producing half the tires made in America, and by 1926, Goodyear had become the largest rubber company in the world. There was nothing much else going on in Akron other than the rubber tire industry, 
and Goodyear's owner Sieberling had become a mega philanthropist, and he built hospitals and schools and accomplished many projects with his great wealth, pursuing ventures that would benefit his employees. And there were other rubber companies in Akron, including Firestone, so it could be said that it was in Akron where the rubber meets the road. Firestone had started a rubber plantation in Liberia in 1926 by loaning the Liberians $5 million and leasing 1 million acres of land from them. And an American was ensconced with the Liberian government to supervise the collection of rent from Firestone and to oversee the profits on the production of rubber. And the language they used with the natives was Portuguese. Firestone built homes in Liberia for the tens of thousands of workers, and he also built medical clinics and schools and roads, and several hundred Americans lived on the rubber plantation where they made vacuum hoses and galoshes, but mostly they made tires. To each group of laborers a district is allotted, containing about 100 to 150 rubber trees, footpaths having been made through the forest to separate trees, the tapping operation begins with the aid of a machado, a short-handled hatchet of American manufacture which has now been generally introduced. Incisions are made in the bark of the tree. This operation commences at daybreak. Beneath each incision is fixed a small collecting vessel to catch the latex which trickles out. 150 trees yields on an average about 45 liters of latex at each tapping. Assuming that the whole collecting season includes 20 tappings at one estrada footpath will yield on an average about 900 liters of latex taken in the calabashes to the storage place and is there worked up to rubber in the following way. The latex is poured into flat dishes from which it is scooped out and poured over a thick stick. Supported at one end on a rough wooden framework, the stick with the adherent latex being then rotated by the hands while it is held in the smoke from a fire. The formation of a thin pellicle of rubber round the stick is brought into brought about partly by the heat of the fire and partly by the action of the chemical compounds contained in the smoke. By the repetition of this operation, a ball of rubber is gradually built up. The Manufacture of Rubber Goods, a practical handbook for the use of manufacturers, chemists, and others by Adolf Heil and Dr. W. Esch, translated from the German by Edward W. Lewis, London, Charles Griffin and Company, Limited, 1919, page 7 and 8. On the rubber plantation, machines were introduced to turn the latex into rubber instead of groups of people having to hold the big sticks over the fires, and huge machines were washed huge machines washed the rubber rather than it being done by hand, and in this book the machines were stamped with their makers' names Harburger Eisenwerk, C. J. Haubel Chemnitz. Gebauer of Berlin, and the machines for drying the rubber were stamped with Mühlenbauenstalt und Maschinenfabrik vorm Gebrüderschsek Dresden. For every German machine there was an English one. David Bridge and Company Engineers, Castleton, Manchester, and Francis Shaw and Company Engineers, Bradford, Manchester, England, while other machines just said Humboldt. And on the 7th of December, in 1942, the British West African silver would be retired and replaced by the U.S. dollar to become the currency of Liberia. No matter how successful and good Mr. Firestone was, he would be no match for his son's drinking problem, and when Firestone invited the Oxford groups to visit Akron, they became established in the city where Bill W. would be sent on business in 1935, after he'd gotten sober from a visit by the Oxfordersh meeting at Sam Shoemaker's Cavalry House in New York. Calvary. Cavalry. Calvary House in New York. Akron had been named after the Greek word that meant summit or peak, and Akron was in Summit County, Iowa, and the National Rubber Machinery Company was in the business of making things needed by the tire factories. 
The price of rubber had fallen with the depression, and Akron had seriously begun to suffer and was in need of an infusion of capital from the stock market, and Bill W. was sent with some co-workers to make them an offer, but he lost the stockholder vote to a Swedish guy, and his co-workers went back to New York, leaving Bill behind at the Mayflower Hotel. Bill heard the glasses full of alcohol clinking down the hall as laughter floated towards him from the hotel bar, and he looked at the telephone directory next to the phone booth, hoping to find an Oxford group. He looked down the church directory and pink picked Dr. Tunks because of the name. It was a funny name, so Bill thought he'd call him just on that basis. He called and asked if there were any Oxford groups in the church, and Dr. Tunk said, Yes, I do have a chapter there, and gave him a list of names. Children of the Healer, the story of Dr. Bob's kids, by Bob Smith and Sue Smith Windows, as told the P. Christ Christine Brewer, Illinois, Parkside Publishing Corporation, 1992, page 35. When he called Reverend Tunks, Bill W. had been sober for five months and had been attending Oxford meetings, and the woman in the Oxford group that he called was the daughter-in-law of the Goodyear Company's owner, and she'd been living in the gatehouse with her three teenage children while her husband was living in the mansion with his family. Bill W. had discovered that the secret of staying sober was talking with other sober alcoholics, and Mrs. Sieberling had been going to the Oxford meetings and knew an alcoholic that Bill W. might be able to help, and she would say later that she'd been praying for God to send someone to help Dr. Bob Holbrook Smith after she'd heard in a meeting something along these lines. I have a secret problem. What is it, Dr. Bob? It's a terrible thing that nobody knows. You can share it, Bob. We're here for you. I'm so afraid that if people knew I would be ruined for life. It will never get better if you keep it secret, Bob. All right, then. I'm an alcoholic. I drink every day. I can't get through a day without at least one or two drinks and sometimes more. The stunned looks on their faces told Dr. Bob that they were shocked to find out he had such a problem with his drinking, but the truth was that they were stunned to discover he thought they didn't know. Dr. Bob and his wife Anne had been going to the Oxforder meetings for two and a half years when Bill W. showed up, and at the time a doctor was earning $5,000 a year, but with the depression, Dr. Bob had been letting most of his patients slide, and he was keeping a drawer full of unpaid bills, and Dr. Bob would have lost his house except for the mortgage moratorium declared by FDR in 1933 that let people stay in their houses even though they couldn't make their mortgage payments. Bill W. and Dr. Bob were both from Vermont, and they'd both gotten married within one year of each other, Bill in January of 1918 and Dr. Bob the summer before. And their mutual love of the effect of alcohol welded a bond between them that would outlast their mortal existence. Dr. Bob had been born in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, in 1879, and he grew up 90 miles away from Bill W., and Dr. Bob went to Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire, where he joined the Kappa 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 fraternity and majored in drinking. Dr. Bob graduated in 1902 and worked for three years selling platform scales for the trucking industry until he enrolled at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor in 1905 to study medicine, and Dr. Bob transferred to Rush Medical College in Chicago in the fall of 1907, and he would graduate from Rush Medical in 1910. When Dr. Bob had been a senior in high school, he met a woman at a dance in Vermont named Ann Robinson Ripley, who was an undergraduate of Wellesley College, and Ann lived in Oak Park, Illinois, a half-hour drive from Rush Medical, and she would marry Dr. Bob after a 17-year whirlwind courtship, which meant it took 17 years for her to talk him into it. After graduating from Wellesley, 
Anne had gone back to Oak Park to teach school, so Dr. Bob had been able to visit her frequently after he transferred to Rush Medical. As Dr. Bob's drinking increased through the years, he thought that becoming a surgeon would allow him to keep better hours, so he went to the Mayo Clinic for further training to become a proctology surgeon. Rush Medical in Chicago was named after the only doctor to have signed the Declaration of Independence, and Dr. Rush had taught Clark of Lewis and Clark the doctoring skills he would need for his adventure to the Pacific. While Dr. Bob was at Rush Medical, the Saddlers from Battle Creek had just graduated the year before in 1906, and the Saddlers were practicing medicine in Chicago by blending science with the Bible. William Samuel Sadler had been born in Indiana four years before Dr. Bob, and he'd moved to Michigan to work at the Battle Creek Sanitarium that was owned by the health pioneers, the Kelloggs, who had invented granola. And this prominent health enterprise of the Kelloggs would have been well known to the students and faculty of Rush Medical when Dr. Bob arrived in Chicago in 1905. Sometime between 1906 and 1910, the Saddlers tried to help a man who was always talking in his sleep, and he channeled entities that seemed to be from another planet. And what the sleeping man said would be written down for publication in what would be called the Urantia book, and the book would say that the Jesus manifestation is a marvelous mystery that everyone is busy watching and that he promised to return some day. The Urantia book said that angels are born fully grown and don't understand very well what it is to be human, and angels also don't feel pain, so it takes a leap of faith for them to accept that God loves human beings and that suffering is the bridge between God and man. To these writers, there's something unique and marvelous about being human, while the biggest problem for the angels is that God knows that great comedy is born of great tragedy and both the good and bad angels lack a sense of humor. The book said that God had asked the angels to work for his created humans, and a third of them fell for refusing to be servants to human beings, and the devil didn't start out thinking he was superior to God, but that he was superior to humans. The devil wanted to show God that humans did not appreciate God as much as angels did, and so the devil sent demons out to show God how bad humans were, and yet God continued to like us, and evil is not choosing between worshipping God and worshipping Satan, but between choosing to honor God's love for humans or going along with Satan's hatred of them. After listening and writing down to what the sleeping man was saying about the government of the universe, the Saddlers went to Vienna in 1910 and studied for a year under Sigmund Freud while Dr. Bob was finally graduating from Rush Medical that year after having been held back a year because of his drinking. Freud would die on the 23rd of September in 1939, and while psychological theories were all the rage, People preferred Jung to Freud because he wasn't Jewish. The Sadlers had been teaching at the McCormick Theological Seminary that was six miles away from Rush Medical after they graduated from Rush in 1906, and there was every likelihood that the Sadlers and Dr. Bob had shared the same professors. The bulk of the Urantia book would be written from 1934 to 1935, and it mentioned prayer and meditation on page 1387, and conscious contact on page 1421, and spiritual experience on page 1732, and while only a small number of those in what they were calling the contact committee ever knew who the sleeping subject was, it had been kept secret so that people wouldn't want to worship the channeler. Dr. Bob had gone for further medical school at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, to become a surgeon proctologist, and 
Somewhere along the line, Dr. Bob got a tattoo of a blue dragon with red flames that went around his left arm from his shoulder to his wrist. And Dr. Bob had also gotten a tattoo of a compass with 32 points. And when asked about them, he would make a joke about how drunk he must have been at the time. Attending the Oxford groups had done little to slow down Dr. Bob's drinking. And when Bill W. showed up on Mother's Day in 1935, Bill W. told Bob that the trick was to have meetings with like-minded people and that only meetings with other real alcoholics worked, not just to stay sober, but to inspire and thrill them beyond their best ever day drinking with a joy. That beggared description. The alcoholics were quitting not because they didn't love to drink, but because they loved being sober more, and their sobriety would start when they stopped wanting to be sick and started wanting to be well. To show Bob exactly how it worked, Bill W. stayed with Dr. Bob and his wife Ann for 90 days to hold sober meetings at Dr. Bob's house, and their third member's sobriety date was the 26th of June in 1935, and he checked out of the hospital a free man on the 4th of July. Bill and Dr. Bob were about to meet Bill D., a stocky, handsome man with a captivating drawl, a congenial, folksy manner, and a full head of wavy hair, which would turn white in his later years. At the time of their phone call, this congenial and folksy soul had just beaten up two nurses and was strapped down in a bed at City Hospital. Pass it on. Page 152 and 3. When they started having drunks over to the house, Minister Wright came over and told Dr. Bob that he wasn't welcome in the Presbyterian Church anymore. It was causing a lot of friction among the congregation. What he was trying to tell him was that alcoholics weren't very desirable and they weren't really church material. My mother and father were very hurt. Children the Healer, page 127. Dr. Bob took his kids to a synagogue and to a Catholic church and all the Protestant denominations, and they even went to hear from the Christian scientists. I think maybe he was trying to teach us that every person has their own concept of God. No two of us have the same conception, Ibid. The Akron meetings allowed the wives to attend because Dr. Bob thought that the wives should come to hear the alcoholic stories to find out that their own husbands were not the worst drunks on the earth. The women said, well, it was the depression. We had to stick with them whether we wanted to or not. We had to eat, and the kids had to eat. Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, a biography with recollections of early AA in the Midwest, New York, Alcoholics Anonymous, World, World Services, Inc., 1980, page 236. Bill W. had distanced himself from the Oxford groups in large part because they didn't like the Catholics, and he thought this would discourage the Irish, so... Lois and Bill had been on their own trying to get people sober, while back in Akron, Dr. Bob was working with the hospitals and having a much better time of it. The only thing that really worked was to bring a person into the hospital and talk to them after they'd become sober in some little time, whether it took a day or three weeks or a week or more. Whether it took a day or three days or a week or more, and that method became effective and the rest is history anonymous. Dr. Bob was a prominent man in Akron. Everybody knew him. When he stopped drinking, people asked, What's this not-drinking liquor club you've got over there? A Christian fellowship, he'd reply. That's because we started meetings with a prayer and ended them that way. Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 118 and 19. Dr. Bob would let them drink whiskey in the hospital, but they had to drink a decent shot of peraldehyde first, and that dose of peraldehyde would render them unconscious for upwards of three days. When they came to, Dr. Bob would tell them that they'd become sensitized to alcohol like a diabetic or someone with allergies, and that they must not drink another drop or the consequences could be fatal. The standard became a 10-day stay, and the only reading material the new AAs were allowed during their first hospitalization was the Bible. And it may seem contradictory, but many of these Bible-reading people were both superstitious and regularly enjoyed dabbling in the occult. 
There were astrologers on every street corner, and people held nightly seances in most neighborhoods, along with table-tapping parties and card readings and other gypsy practices. And in the name of science, people would get hypnotized at parties, and all this occult behavior was not just great fun, but they were also deadly serious about it. People frequently saw ghosts and other spiritual manifestations, and back in Russia, Rasputin had not been an anomaly, but a creature of the times. And with immigration from the old world into America, untold manners of superstition and psychic parlor games had come with them into the American Midwest. Any good drunk worth their salt readily and enthusiastically signed on to the theory of ultimate and irrevocable disaster described by the anonymous writers of the big book. We are like passengers of a great liner the moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 17. It was no mere coincidence in the spiritual world that the Titanic had left from Waterloo Station, and AAs were told in the meetings that failing to work the steps was just like changing chairs on the Titanic. Near you, alcoholics are dying helplessly like people in a sinking ship. If you live in a large place, there are hundreds, high and low, rich and poor. These are future fellows of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 152. Bill W. would also write, Like a gaunt prospector, belt drawn in over the last ounce of food, our pick struck gold. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 128. After four years, Dr. Bob's hospital had enough of the drunks because they owed a lot of money. And AAs were in debt to other hospitals as well. And some early AAs began putting people up in their homes and charging them $12 a week. The tradition became that they would make sure the newcomer knew all about the program before being allowed into a meeting, and two out of three of their prospects got sober. Dr. Bob got into this with Goodrich and then with Goodyear. Finally, we had a deal with three rubber companies that if they had anyone they wanted us to try to sober up, they'd call us. And in turn, if we had someone we had sober who needed a job, we could call them. We worked that out for several years in the 1940s, and it worked good. We even had a judge he, Dr. Bob, was involved with. This judge issued a, used to issue a summons for a guy to join AA. Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 288. It became obvious to Bill W. that they needed a book because they were repeating the same thing to new people over and over, and it would be much more simple to write it down in black and white for them. Dick B. said there were really 79 writers of the big book, and they all struggled against the notion that there was something morally wrong with drinking alcohol because the sting of prohibition was still fresh. Yet without prohibition, AA would have gone down as just another fringe religious group, and compared with the truly wacko church ladies, the general public welcomed AA as a better path than the repression of the abolitionists. Ebby got a job working for the Ford Motor Company in a small town in September of 1936, and when he started drinking again, writing the big book became Bill W.'s prime directive, and he would mention Ford in the chapter, The Family Afterward. Henry Ford once made a wise remark to the effect that experience is the thing of supreme value in life. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 124. Bill W. had almost taken a job at Towns Hospital in September of 1936, but the other AAs said, why should we volunteer to do what you get paid for? And Bill realized that AA could only happen for love and not for money. In February of 1936, Bill had started getting work again and became a director of a car parts company from Indiana, and a couple of the AAs got into a business running gasoline service stations that were called gasoline dealers, and their secretary was a German girl named Ruth Hawk, 
and the business was located at 17 William Street in Newark, and Ruth found out pretty quickly that these people were more interested in helping drunks than in pumping gas.